To convince people effectively, you have to use convincing language. You have to use logic and reason. There are forms of reasoning that we're going to work with. One of these is called inductive reasoning. Inductive reasoning is based on repeated observation, such as the sun came up two days ago, the sun came up yesterday, the sun came up today, therefore the sun will probably come up tomorrow. So, observation, 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 generalization. Suppose you want to convince us to wear seatbelts. You could say something like, seatbelts save lives in Florida. Seatbelts save lives in Pennsylvania. Seatbelts save lives in Ohio. Therefore, seatbelts would save lives across the United States. So again, observation, 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 generalization. It's usually good to have at least three separate observations, four or five is even better, and you can condense the observations down into a single statement in certain instances, such as, the sun has come up every day for the last 12 million years, therefore the sun will probably come up tomorrow. So that is inductive reasoning. Now, let's consider deductive reasoning. Deductive reasoning is almost like a mathematical formula. It's almost like A equals B, B equals C, therefore A equals C. Or A causes B, B causes C, therefore A causes C. And each of these letters would not simply be a word, it would be a phrase or an entire sentence. You could say something like, drinking beer to the point of intoxication leads to impaired driving ability. Impaired driving ability leads to the possibility of traffic fatalities. Therefore, drinking beer to the point of intoxication leads to the possibility of traffic fatalities. So, things leading to each other. And this is another means of persuading people, especially if you can plug in numbers into these forms of reasoning. Another thing that is helpful is analogical reasoning. Reasoning by analogy are two things sufficiently similar that one justifies the other. You might ask, smoking tobacco is legal, therefore smoking marijuana should be legal. Well, are they the same activity? They both involve smoking, but different plants and different drugs. The drug inside of tobacco is nicotine. The drug inside of marijuana is THC or tetrahydrocannabinol. The effect of nicotine is that it is a physically addictive stimulant. The effect of THC, well the jury's still out on that because it's variously class classified as a stimulant and a depressant and a psychotropic agent. So let's just call it an intoxicant. In any, ca any case, the effects are different. Do you know someone who uses tobacco every day? Probably. Do you know someone who uses marijuana every day? Probably. Is it physically addictive? No. Is it psychologically addictive? For some people it appears to be. Nevertheless, they are different drugs, and the only thing they have in common is the usual means by which people ingest them, smoking. And even then, some people chew tobacco, some people, from what I'm told, eat marijuana inside of certain foods, so you cannot use analogical reasoning to compare the two. You can compare things only if they are sufficiently similar to one another so that one would justify the other. Yet another approach to reasoning is causal reasoning. Not casual reasoning, causal reasoning. Identifying the cause of a problem. Identifying why a problem exists so that you can figure out what to do to solve the problem. Back in the early 1990s, in big cities across the country, crimes committed by teenage boys was on a huge upswing. So that, along about 1995, President Bill Clinton was thinking about issuing a state of national emergency. Some cities, to deal with this, hired more cops. Some cities put in place new educational programs. Other cities put in place new after-school programs. And all of a sudden, around the end of 1995, the crime rate for teenage boys in big cities dropped like a rock. And the cities that hired more cops said, great, the cops helped. And the cities that put in place new programs for after-school education said, our programs did a real good job. Maybe, but not necessarily. 
You may have heard of the phrase Roe versus Wade, a famous court case. Back in 1971, I believe, a woman in Texas wanted to get an abortion, but it was illegal in Texas. It was illegal in most states. It was available in New York State, and it was partially available in other states around the country. Most states had it outlawed. Now, there's one big group of women who tend to seek abortions. They tend to be young, uneducated or undereducated, unemployed or underemployed, and they tend oftentimes to not have a partner to help them through life. And this is the biggest group of young women who were seeking abortions. But as a result of the Roe versus Wade decision, abortion clinics started popping up all over the country along about 1975. And these women who previously could not get abortions were now able to get them. As a result of that, babies, especially baby boys, stopped being born into an environment where, when they hit puberty, they might turn to crime. The problem with boys is that when puberty kicks in and testosterone kicks in, they get rambunctious, they get assertive, they want to be badasses, they want to break the rules. These boys were that crime wave. But they aged out of the teenage population at the end of 1995, and they were not replaced in the same numbers because of abortion. Here's where things get really tricky. Suppose you wanted to deliver a persuasive speech on the topic of abortion. You could logically say that abortion prevents crime because abortion prevents baby boys from being born into an environment where, when they grow up, they might turn to crime. This is why it's important to know the causes of things. I had a student once who was delivering a speech right after the shootings at Sandy Hook Elementary School. He delivered a persuasive speech on the notion that teachers ought to carry guns. He made this statement. The children at Sandy Hook Elementary died because their teacher did not have a gun. So we later analyzed this statement. The children were specifically targeted by a sociopath armed with automatic weapons. Could their teacher have saved them if she had a gun? Maybe, maybe not. We don't know. You could not say that this happened because that happened. It's not a causal relationship. The closest you could get using any of these forms of logic would be to use inductive reasoning, repeated observation, if such things could be scientifically verified. If you could truthfully say something like this. In 1972, in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, a group of school children targeted by a sociopath armed with automatic weapons were saved because their teacher had a gun. In 1984, in Butte, Montana, a group of school children targeted by a sociopath armed with automatic weapons were saved because their teacher had a gun. In 1996, in Tampa, Florida, a group of school children targeted by a sociopath armed with automatic weapons were saved because their teacher had a gun. Then you could reason, you could generalize that possibly the children of Sandy Hook Elementary would have been saved if their teacher had had a gun. But we don't know. In any case, you can't use that form of logic, nor can you use causal reasoning to lead up to that point of view. When you are doing research, especially on controversial topics, you have to dig deep into the data. I had another student, young fellow, who was trying to persuade the audience why it's okay and beneficial for Americans to own guns. Guns is always a big topic. He made this statement. According to such and such a citation source, a valid one, last year, 258 Americans died from being shot by rifles. Now that's a bad thing and those 258 people are missed by their families. But in the grand scheme of things, that's not a very big number, and that should not be a deterrent to Americans owning guns. So I'm sitting there listening to this guy, thinking to myself, do you have any plans to mention the other 12,000 annual deaths that occur as a result of guns? Several different valid sources can give you that number. And if you dig deeper into that data, you find that the majority of gun deaths in the United States don't occur because of rifles, nor do they occur because of automatic weapons or semi-automatic weapons. If you dig into the data, what you find is that most gun-related deaths in the United States are caused related to handguns. And you can think, oh, okay, people are defending themselves. Not necessarily. Dig deeper into the data. You find that the majority of handgun-related deaths are suicide. And you can think, well, 
Maybe people bought the guns to commit suicide? No, researchers are studying this. And one of the ways they study this is, a lot of the people who attempt suicide with a handgun don't succeed, they survive. So after they get out of the hospital, they get interviewed by a psychologist who asks them, why did you try to kill yourself with a handgun? The answer is pretty much always the same. Onset of horrible, terrible sadness because of an event. Maybe a death of a family member, the end of a marriage, loss of a job, something really, really, really bad happens and made them so sad that they didn't know what to do. You have probably dealt with people who were very sad. Maybe you've been very sad yourself. You've probably dealt with people who were very angry and who would not listen to reason. And maybe once upon a time you were very angry and people could not reason with you. When emotion takes over the brain, whether it's severe anger or severe sadness, the brain cannot reason. It can't think clearly. And if someone's in a temporary state of really deep sadness, they often cannot reason to themselves, I'll feel better tomorrow, I'll feel better next week, I can get counseling, I can get help from this. That part of the brain gets shorted out. They can't do any reasoning around that. But if they remember that there's a gun over there in the closet or a gun over there in the drawer, a handgun, that is why the majority of deaths related to guns in the United States is handguns. And two things have to be present for that to happen. Temporary, terrible sadness, and access to a gun. And if the statement is brought up, well, if people are going to kill themselves, they'll find some other way to do it. Not if you dig deeper into the data. If you compare the suicide rates of countries like the United States where citizens have access to handguns, uh, compare that to countries where citizens do not have access to handguns, the suicide rate overall is several hundred percent lower per capita in the countries where, where citizens cannot get access to handguns. This is how deep you need to dig into the data for the subject matter of your speech. Whatever you choose, dig deep into the data. Find the reason behind the reason behind the reason behind the reason. So now that we've talked about reasoning, we're going to move on and talk about additional formats that we're going to use in our upcoming persuasive speeches.